Okay, so I'm aware in between everyone and lunch. And so what, we, what we're doing in the research section is just presenting some ongoing research, some interesting research papers, and then some stuff that we um, uh, publish. And we published this recently. This is, um, it's around, I suppose, the lead up to the evidence cardiac arrest trial and expedited transport versus continuous, continued on scene resuscitation and refractory cardiac arrest. We did a systematic review and analysis, and we did that to try and kind of pave the landscape for the evidence cardiac arrest trial and look to see what was out there. Um, I really have to thank Henry uh, Sue there, who's an MD uh, research student from Sydney University, who um, did a lot of work in this. And then the NHMRC, CTC in Sydney Uni with Professor Keach was very helpful. And then you can see some um, other notables there, like Mark Dennis, who does a lot of research with us in cardiac arrest, and then Andrew Coggins out at Westmead Hospital. All right, so why are we talking about this? If this is uh, Japanese data from, you know, huge numbers of patients within, in refractory cardiac arrest, and I suppose the definition of refractory arrest varies in place to place, but generally seen as people who don't come back to gain, regain their circulation after three shocks, three or more shocks, or after 10 to 15 minutes of CPR. And I've put in, if you look over here, this is overall um, outcome, either survival in little blue dots or favorable neurological outcome in red. And I think most of us, as both doctors, paramedics, nurses, and population are interested in neurological outcome. And when you get to about the 20 minute mark, your chance of surviving if you're in refractory arrest is by 2%. So it's pretty poor. This dial here, a number here, is the median response time for New South Wales ambulance to respond to cardiac arrest. So for a lot of these patients, by the time the paramedics get there, the neuro survival rough outcome rate is about 10%. But you know when you get there, by 10, 15% chance of getting a survivor back intact. So there's a lot of balance going on and discussion going on in various different jurisdictions around, you know, do you do on scene resuscitation? Do you, or do you try and gap it to a hospital? And obviously time is of the, uh, of the necessity here in this. We do know that on scene in a lot of jurisdictions, including New South Wales, you can perform high performance CPR at the scene. And you could argue that transporting someone, getting them out of their apartment or out of their house and putting them in the back of an ambulance and opening and closing the door, putting them in the car, does lead to lower performance CPR. Um, you could argue that on scene resuscitation has lower system implication. You know, if the patient runs through the protocol and doesn't survive, then they are deceased and they don't perturb the hospital specifically. Um, but if you bring a patient in arrest to hospital, it definitely can have some higher system implication. Um, and that's certainly something that uh, the, the ministries for health in various countries are, are interested in. And then we do know that on scene treatment in terms of diagnostics and also interventions and um, uh, diagnostics and interventions are restricted. There's only so much you can do on the scene um, versus you know advanced diagnostics and interventions that are available in the hospital, such as a cath lab or ECMO CPR. And what is that inflection point and at what time period do you decide to stay on the scene or go to the hospital? We don't know. All right, so this uh, was a systematic review. It followed the PRISMA guidelines. And um, I think for anyone within our service, if they want to do a systematic review, it's worth doing. It, there's some clear guidelines on how to do one. And um, they're labor intensive, but are rewarding to do, I think. Um, so the PRISMA guidelines were followed, which, which is the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And basically that's a checklist and everyone essentially has to use it. And then good practice is to register your, your, um, uh, your systematic review on Prospero, which is a international perspective register of systematic reviews. And then Covidence, software was used uh, to perform this review. So we had a couple of key definitions and one was process definition. So we categorized patients exposure groups in which authors explicitly describe the patient as rapid 
or expedited transport versus delayed or extended or prolonged unseen treatment. So in some papers that we reviewed, they actually explicitly said, we are trying to rapidly expedite them to the hospital or we're doing extended or unseen resuscitation. So that's what we call pro process definition. And then there was, we then came up with time definition. So where they didn't use process, we looked at time. And with the time, um, we basically used a 20 minute cutoff, so less than 20 or greater than 20. So we dichotomized on that. We picked those numbers basically based on a lot of uh, EMS protocols based on when you can terminate resuscitation or how long you have to do resuscitation on scene before you consider transporting. And so that's certainly the case in New South Wales. So we, we, we picked that number and we also picked that, you know, if you look at the data in refractory arrest after 20 minutes, your chance of ROSC is very low. So we picked, we picked that number. So we included RCTs, non-randomized controlled trials, observational studies, um, and we did include articles that weren't primarily in English if they had an English translation. And we excluded any study that had initial rhythm of asystole, trauma arrest, pediatric arrest, mixed ped in adult populations, no outcome of interest reported, obviously non-human studies, and we excluded case series case reports, reviews, abstracts, editorials, comments and letters, and we'd exclude non-English papers if there was no um, translation. We used a classic kind of systematic literature search, used MeSH terms, keywords and derivatives, and we deduplicated um, papers that we found using EndNote and Covidence, so we didn't end up with duplications. So then we end up with a lot of potential papers and we use a two-step eligibility and selection process. So initially, two authors using the COVID and software, which is really good, uh, independently screen titles and ab abstracts of those of that list of articles based on the predefined inclusion criteria I talked about. And then we excluded uh, or included where both agreed. Um, if there was dispute, that was resolved by a third author or arbiter. Now, those that were excluded, we actually got a fourth um, author to review all the excluded and found, they found no uh, further articles for inclusion. So outcome measures we were interested in was obviously survival to 30 days and uh, hospital discharge, favorable neurological outcome at 30 days and hospital uh, at 30 days or hospital discharge. And we use CPC one uh, or two as good outcome or modified ranking score of 0 to 2. We actually did change, uh, we made a change in the outcome from the, the original Prospero after we initially screened um, the article showing significant heterogeneity in studies and how they reported outcomes, which was flabbergasting really when you think about it in terms of um, outcomes in cardiac arrest. Um, and then we reported using odds ratio. This is modified ranking score. If you're not one or two, you're deemed have a reasonable outcome. It's pretty loud. Rod Wheatley can hear him across the planet. Um, positive outcome was CPC one or two. So again, these are reasonably crude outcome measures. They're not very detailed, but it's 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 what we've got. There's also, always a risk of bias when you do a systematic review um, of papers. So. We had two authors independently review the RCTs using the Cochrane Rob2, and then for non-RCTs use Robin's Eye. So these are the kind of standard uh, measures that are used. And again, it can be done in software. And um, we used a graphical re representation of that. And disagreement was resolved by discussion. So actually, we discussed disagreement between us. And then the certainty of evidence was used uh, was done using grade. So just for grade grading of evidence, you know, you all read papers on various different things. The certainty of evidence varies from very low to high. So the, where high is the authors, authors have a lot of confidence that the true effect is similar to the estimated effect. And low is the true effect is probably markedly different to the estimated effect. Um, we had a predefined data extraction form that we had in Covidence. And we used headings of authors, year, design, study population, demographics, and geographics. And where propensity match data was available, we preferred that over co whole cohort data. The stats is slightly confusing, I have to say, but um, 
basically I'll skip over some of the, the modeling we did, but basically the treatment effects was report an odds ratio and we used the I squared to estimate proportion of variability attributable to heterogeneity rather than sampling error. Um, and we also looked at the region of study. So it became clear as we looked through these uh, studies that there was definitely a Western hemisphere versus Eastern hemisphere or Western culture uh, or Asian Eastern uh, versus Western cultural difference in outcomes, but also likely in systems and how patients in cardiac arrest are, are treated. Um, number of recruited patients in median year was also assessed and then we looked at publication bias as well. Um, and obviously publication bias is is where you fail to publish, you know, based on the direction of, this, of, of the finding or on uh, the strength of the study. So, for example, publishing a negative study, um, so sometimes pay studies that have negative outcomes are not published. We're getting better at that now. We are starting to publish negative studies, but it is something that um, needs to be looked at. And then we did a Bayesian meta-analysis as a sensitivity analysis. The sensitivity analysis um, actually essentially assesses the robustness of the findings or conclusions based on the primary analysis, and it's quite important to do in these studies. Um, there's a, you can scan that QR, um, but there's a very good old, 10 years old description of what sensitivity analysis is, and it is worth reading. It's quite easy to read, um, and I'll put a link up also on the website to it. Okay, like I said, we had predefined data form headings, and then we talked about um, that already. So you can see a lot of Weep goes on. We had, we started with 3,900 papers. We duplicates 1,200 removed. So then we looked closely at 2,700. We excluded 2,600. Kind of eligibility is getting down towards 83. And then we looked at got down to 24. And you can see why we um, there's a lack. Of, if there's a main the main reason we excluded more of them then was a lack of comparator group using time definitions. So where there was explicitly reported less than 20 minutes or over 20 minutes. So we only ended up with nine papers. You can see even in cardiac arrest, which is a lot of research going on, there's not much in the way of high quality uh, papers to analyze. So those nine studies made up 224,000 patients. And basically in the expedited arm, the survival to discharge was 10.9%. Survival to 30 days was 24%, weirdly, and survival um, with favorable neuro neurological outcome was 6.9. We think that 24% is because of a, one small paper that um, uh, just made up a different cohort slightly. So that kind of, it's hard to, hard to explain in any other way. And then if we look at the standard arm, survival to discharge was 9%, 30 days was 14.8%, and favorable neuro 6.5. So a kind of rough way of looking at it is there was no significant difference between the two groups across 220, a quarter of a million patients as to whether you expedited them or not or stayed on the scene. Plus the survival to neuro good neurological outcome is appalling. Like it's 6.5, 6.9%. It's really poor. This is showing a kind of a characteristics of interventions and outcome and bias, so there's moderate bias going on, mainly retrospective. These are the papers that met time definition versus process definition. You'll see Brian Grunau's name in a lot of uh, the papers in resuscitation based out of Canada, really um, amazing guy, does a lot of research looking at um, cardiac arrest outcomes. Um, and then a lot of Korean papers, Koreans, it's, really reporting a lot in cardiac arrest. Obviously a big slide, and these are all the papers kind of listed down, but one of the things just to draw your attention to is if you look at survival to discharge, survival to 30 days or CPC one or two at discharge, NR is not recorded. So you've got all these studies, you collect all these info about cardiac arrest patients and there are NRs everywhere. And it really made me think we do need to do proper prospective registries with good measures of outcome because it's not done that well. Okay, let's look at actually how, how some of these patients went. So 
these are the survival to discharge. And if you look at left of one here is favoring standard resuscitation and to the right of one would favor expedited transport to hospital. And then you've got the confidence interval here. So you can see when you look at time definition group, it kind of looks like it's favoring expedited, but crosses one. And then for the process definition, it's kind of bang in the middle. So, you know, maybe under time definition, it's maybe starting to look like that, but not significant. When we look at survival to 30 days, CPC one or two. So this is looking at neurological outcome. And the previous one was looking at uh, just recovery or, or uh, survival. This is 30 days CPC one or two. Um, in Bohovalak, actually, sorry, it was CBC 1 or 2, 30 days. So, 5 to 30 days, time definition and process. So, you can see in process, it's kind of looking like it's favoring expedited transport. If you use time definition, it's not. Now, having said that, there's a small number of patients in this total group. Remember, we had a quarter of a million patients in total. When you get down to this group, it's quite a small number. So, your total in the expedited group is 389 versus 696. You've got to kind of take that within the context of a small subgroup, but it looks like it's favoring expedited transport. And so this is CPC one or two at discharge. So neurological outcome at discharge time. Right down the middle makes no difference. And then process you add in Grinnell's paper there right down the middle. So makes no difference. This is just we jump we we split them into by ge geography and we looked at uh, regions so eastern um, Asian countries versus western countries. So if you look at the western countries, it was favoring standard resuscitation, stay on the scene, um, but cross one. But in the Asian countries, it favored expedite to hospital. And one of the one of the key reflection points I had when you look at the Korean studies in particular, they rapidly transport, uh, take them off the scene and put them in an ambulance. Uh, I haven't been over there. I don't know how they do things, but it looks like they're able to get them very early on into an ambulance and move them. And you could argue maybe they're doing it too quickly or we're doing it too slow in Western countries. I'm not sure, but they they move them, some of them in under five minutes, quite a big cohort. So uh, I think that's just the way the system has developed. Um, so this is just looking at summary summary of the findings and uh, just odds ratios, etc. So survival to discharge. These are all the numbers. Certainty evidence. So the certainty of the evidence and the grade of evidence and how you, what degree of a hot size piece of salt you you take this with is, whoops, is um, very low. So very low evidence in survival to discharge. And usual care, the risk is uh, 16 per 100. But if you expedite them, the risk is two more per 100. So after 30 days, again, low uh, risk with usual care, 12 per 100, seven more per 100 with expedited. And again, favor, favor neurological outcome, grade is low, risk 135 per 1,000, seven more if you, try, if, uh, you expedite them overall. So discussion points uh, in the short time we have left is there was no, uh, or summaries as well, no benefit of expedited transport across the systematic review. There was a lot of heterogeneity in uh, the cohort. There was moderate risk of bias and the certainty of evidence or the grading of evidence was very low, which surprised me. Um, the RCTs of expedited transport with bundles of care are conflicting. So that's RCTs where there's an explicit reason for the rapid transport, such as some of the ECMO CPR trials um, that we've seen, such as uh, the arrest trial in Minneapolis and the inception trial in the Netherlands recently, which was a negative study. Um, and then the expedited uh, strategy of eCPR that currently exists um, has restrictive criteria. So if you were to empl employ an, an expedited process, the criteria currently are quite restrictive, so it's a low number. We estimate the number of patients who meet criteria by the time they get to hospital is probably between four and 11% of refractory arrest. Resource intensive, obviously costs money, uh, a lot of training involved to do it. And then it's limited, you know, eCPR is limited to a handful of cities and a handful of hospitals at the moment. 
Um, so there's a lack of benefit that either, either, in either strategy may be due to heterogeneity in cardiac arrest manage, management within and between systems and also retrospectively applied definitions. Um, there's a, I would say, though, in all the papers, there's a lack of reporting on mechanical CPR use. So for those patients who are expedited, we're not sure how many had mechanical CPR and therefore guaranteed chest compressions in, in transport. And also there was very limited information on the in interventions performed in the hospital in terms of cath lab or ECMO. And the geography in terms of east-west was, uh, was a significant source of heterogeneity, it made up about a third of the overall heterogeneity in the studies. Um, and I do think we need better definitions. So um, the term expedited transport is not defined in literature and the term um, prolonged on scene resuscitation is also not defined in the literature. So I think those definitions need to occur so we can compare um, data. That is it. Any questions? Back up to... Um, um, do you believe with the evidence that you have looked at that it is financially beneficial yeah. So the question was around: Is it um, financially beneficial to, to run the full resuscitation on the scene or transport to hospital, um, and then do interventions at the hospital? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we're obviously running the evidence cardiac arrest trial in Sydney at the moment, and that's one of the questions in the study. So for patients who meet the um, restrictive ECMO or cath lab criteria, they're being asked to either randomise to stay on scene or to expedite to hospital and either get a cath under mechanical CPR or ECMO and part of that will be health economics analysis. Um, I was at a, a meeting on ECMO CPR in Prague recently and there's a lot of heated debate and discussion around the restrictive criteria that exists currently. And there was kind of two main schools of thought. There was the, that school that felt it should remain restrictive with a view to trying to get guaranteed or high, high likelihood of neurological intact survival and a survival rate anywhere between 25 and 40 percent. And the corollary of that is a one to two percent survival. But other people felt you should open the criteria wider because there will be patients in the systole or non-witness group who will survive intact and those who don't will become organ donors. And then that becomes an ethical um, dilemma because the organ donation does give huge health economic benefit. So part of the evidence trial is going to do a health economics analysis of costly interventions like ECMO. That includes those that go on to organ donation and it will, it will include that, yeah. Yeah, so an organ donor in Australia is worth about a million dollars. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so, so the question was a really good question around um, balancing those that don't survive neurologically intact and, and the cost. So the, the follow, we're doing six month follow up for evidence in, in the cardiac arrest trial. Thankfully, in terms of um, ECMO CPR, say, as a subgroup, their outcomes are very binary, both here and, and globally. They either do they're either CPC one or two or they're brain dead. And they're usually brain dead, declare brain dead within 72 hours, 96 hours. So the the uh, the withdrawal of care is usually fairly quick, and um, interestingly, a patient who doesn't survive a cardiac arrest pre hospital is probably cheaper than someone who survives and is neurologically very devastated. So one of the concerns originally when eCPR in particular started increasing, which it is, was we don't want to be left with patients who are, who are in a vegetative state. That doesn't seem to be the case, um, and it doesn't seem to be the case in prolonged conventional cardiac arrest either. So if you if, if paramedics bring a patient in who's had 60, 50, you know, 60 minutes of CPR, 
and they get a ROSC, they generally end up being palliated. One last question oh, no, keep going. on the same These thing. Are great. Paramedic 2 said adrenaline seems to increase our number of um, non-neurologically intact survivors. Would you agree? Mm. And if ECMA, ECPR is saying, actually, that's good, we're getting binary, they either have a good outcome or they don't, which is yeah. great, that's what we want. Um, and Paramedic 2 seems to show that adrenaline does the opposite of what we want. Mm. Why do you think we are still using adrenaline in out of hospital cardiac arrest? So why are we still using adrenaline? I mean, one of the one of the um, I suppose historically we've always used adrenaline around the world, haven't we? So to to it's a bit like the sea collar thing. Until you um, show evidence of harm, it's going to be very hard to undo something. The other criticism of paramedic two was the median time from arrest. Either, either arrest or arrival of paramedics to adrenaline was 11 minutes. So quite a long time to adrenaline. Um, personally speaking, you know, I can see why adrenaline is used, but I think the interval and the dosage is too, I think the interval is too short and the dosage is too high. Uh, there are other studies. There's a French study going to look at a different dose that's currently enrolling, but they are looking um, with the same interval. So I think we probably need more information um, on adrenaline, I think we should be looking at other drugs as, as well. But again, to do that, it involves a very large study in, you know, paramedic two at 8,000 patients. So that would, that would involve three, $4 million to do that study of a drug that costs five cents. So no, no one's going to fund that study except for the government. So it's a very good question. Kind of, uh, you know, more discussion you know, a milligram every, yeah. every um, second cycle or whatever, whereas yeah. it's probably not not that, you know, that's just, that's just round numbers. It's just total uh, uh, made up. I know. And the more, the more time you spend in, in pig labs and look at the physiology of you know, mammals the same kind of weight as a human or size and same kind of physiology. Giving that one milligram is is a nonsense, really. And it, when you have invasive arterial monitoring and you can kind of predict what your coronary perfusion pressure is going to be through adrenaline, that's what you're mainly targeting. I think that has some merit to it. It's certainly what I try and do is get an art line in and target, you know, the the um, the drug, which is what cardiac anaesthetists have done for decades. And um, yeah, so if you say to a cardiac anaesthetist, give 1,000 mics of adrenaline to that patient, I, I think Nat Cruitt will puke. Great. Um, now that we have, I suppose, a cohort of um, New South Wales ambulance specialists kind of trained in ECMO, mm -hmm. do you think? Uh, as opposed to just the pre-hospital stuff, you know, if someone requires ECMO or retrieval, that will kind of, in the future, you know, New South Wales Ambulance might be doing that as opposed to, uh, no. <laughs> um, no, in the current setup, we have a fairly robust system um, that serves the state. But I think the main focus that we have at the moment is is on the feasibility of a very small number of patients. I think one one of the things we're going to do is if we can prove feasibility of pre hospital CPR, then we'll join a larger study. There's a lot of there's a lot of criticism in ECMO CPR of not having properly com, com, you know designed RCTs comparing ECMO with um, standard treatment. If I ask everyone in the room if they were in refractory arrest, whether they'd want continued standard treatment versus ECMO. It'd be hard to find equipoise, but um, uh, those studies do need to be done. So the the level of evidence within, a, say, something like ECMO CPR is is lowish. So we need more evidence. So I think we'll go from what we're doing to a larger, uh, probably international national RCT before we uh, cross any other bridges. Thanks.